Hi. So in this recording, I'm going to start thermodynamics. In the actual class on September 4th, I'm going to be finishing up, you know, um, I'm going to be finishing up real gases in the first 15 minutes or so, and then I'll be doing thermo. Um, but since I um, covered that material in the last recording, um, then I decided to go ahead and start thermo. So I'm going to do that now. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I, I've talked a little bit, I've told you thermodynamics. I talked about it a little bit on the, on the first day. Um, and it's the study of energy and the flow of energy. And we, can, we chemists are interested, of course, in chemical systems. So later on in the semester, we'll be um, talking about chemical reactions and stuff like that, okay? Um, but what we're gonna uh, start with today is energy. And in particular, internal energy. Internal energy is central to thermodynamics and it's given the symbol U, although you may have seen it in freshman classes if you took them somewhere other than Rhode Island College. Um, um, it's often referred to as E in some textbooks, but here it's we refer to it as, as you. And, um, and really what the internal energy is, is the sum of all the potential energy and the kinetic energy of a sample, of a system or a sample, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so if we think about molecules, and I, I'm going to talk about some simple molecules, like diatomic molecules, where you have only two atoms bonded together, um, that we have different types of kinetic energy. And the first type is translational. You're just that molecule kind of moving around um, and translating. It can go in either of three different directions. It could go along the X, Y, or Z direction. So there are three independent directions of motion. We call these three degrees of freedom, or D, O, F, as I like to say. Anyway, so this is three different directions. This is translational. It's also called linear motion. All right, but there's other kinds of motion that um, molecules can have. Um, and one of them is vibrational. So, you know, we can imagine that, that atoms are attached by, by a spring and that they vibrate. And we know that um, we can see the frequencies at which molecules vibrate on, on the uh, infrared spectrum. So in organic chemistry, you may have you know, measured a CO bond stretching frequency or something like that. Um, but anyway, vibrational motion is very interesting. Um, if you think about um, molecules attached by a, a, a bond as a spring, you know, where, where vibration is possible, you could think that there's a, what we call the equilibrium position, which would be kind of this, uh, this is the regular bond distance. So this is in the equilibrium bond length. That's what I'm calling EQ, okay? But um, this molecule, if it's stretched, so let's put three loops in it, but it's much bigger, okay? So this is the stretched position. If this were, you know, two masses attached by a spring and you pulled it out that far, at, but it's you're holding it, right? It doesn't have any kinetic energy, it's not moving. So it has the maximum potential energy that it will have. And then when you let it go, it'll go, you know, it'll do this. It'll sort of race by its equilibrium position. Okay. And then it'll get all scrunched up. Right? Like that. So this is the, um, this is, and then it stops and then it goes the other way. 
So in these points where it stops, there's no kinetic energy at all and all the energy is potential. So here again, we have the maximum potential energy when it's all scrunched, I don't know, have it, you know, squeezed or whatever. Um, and now as it whizzes by this equilibrium position, which is where it is here, right? It has all kinetic energy and no potential energy because that's the sort of relaxed that that's where it would be if it were just you know stationary and relaxed. Um, so it doesn't you know it needs to be pulled out to have like energy so that it can move when you let it go, potential energy to make it move when it when you do let it go, or scrunch it to make to make it want to go like that you know. So anyway, so basically we have potential energy here switching with all this is all potential, all kinetic, and then here all potential. And so what you get with a, with, a, with a vibrating molecule is both potential energy and kinetic energy, but it keeps switching back and forth. So vibrational motion has both kinetic energy and potential energy, and both contribute to the system's internal energy. is you. Okay, so that's vibrational motion, but there's a third type of kinetic energy, um, which is rotational. And if you have a diatomic, there are actually two sort of independent rotations that it can undergo. One I'd say looks like this, which sort of rotates in the plane of what I'm writing on, and one where it sort of goes in and out of that plane. Um, so, you know, there's two, these two rotational degrees of freedom of motion. Um, now, if you had a monatomic gas, so like, for example, helium gas, where you just have a single molecule, you would have no vibrations, no rotations, you would have only uh, translational kinetic energy, um, and that's all you would have, okay? Um, so is there anything else? Yes, there's a lot of other things. There is potentially electronic energy, which is, would be a form of potential energy. Like for example, if a molecule excited one of its electrons to an excited state, and so now the molecule has more energy, it could use that energy to, to maybe undergo a different kind of reaction or it could release that energy and go back to the ground state. Um, so molecules can be in excited states. But actually at room temperature, virtually, all molecules are in their ground electronic state. Okay, so how would you get it to an excited state? You'd have to supply energy in the form of light. So you'd need to shine light. <laughs> H nu is often light, that's why I wrote H instead of light. <laughs> you need to shine light uh, of the correct frequency to get molecules to go into the excited state, so to excite molecules. So electronic energy is really not important to us. Um, what else, what else is there? Well, if you have a sample of a liquid, let's say, you have the potential energy due to intermolecular attractions. In other words, intermolecular forces, okay? So for example, in water, you have hydrogen bonding, among other things. You also have dispersion forces, 
and other things like that. And, and hydrogen bonds, they stabilize the liquid. So for example, if you had a water sample that's in the liquid, oops. This is H2O liquid versus H2O gas, where they're basically non interacting. Okay. Um, the internal energy of the liquid is less than the internal energy of the gas. So that, that stabilization, I'll talk a little more about that later when we do our example. Um, all right, well, even including intermolecular forces, we still left the biggest contribution for last. So the biggest contribution to changes in the internal energy for chemical systems has to do with bonding. Bonding is really important here um, because of how it affects the internal energy of the system. All right, so I have a set of sort of cartoony slides to show you. Here's the first one. And the reason they're looking kind of cartoonish is because I use these for a talk I gave to scientists, but also non-scientists at, a, uh, at a, a seminar that the old vice president had that he used to have on an interesting topic every year. Like one year it was happiness. And the year I talked, it was about, it was, it was on energy. And I thought, oh boy, there's gonna be a lot of people talking about energy, you know, like this. Um, philosophical concept or something. And I thought, well, someone should really talk about thermodynamics. So I ended up giving a little talk about chemical thermodynamics. And that's why um, these slides that I'm using have balls and sticks and they don't have, you know, it's not like I didn't write H2. I didn't want to get anybody all confused about what I was talking about. So, um, so what this shows in a very cartoonish way is that, and something I've mentioned before, is that breaking bonds requires energy. So you could see here, if I have internal energy here on this axis, that when you have two atoms bonded together, that has a lower energy, it's an uphill process to break them up into two separate atoms. You have to put energy in to do that. And of course, the, op the, you know, the inverse of that or something like that, is that forming bonds releases, in general, energy. Okay, and, and so that would be a downhill process energetically. So, you know, I, I would say that U for bonded atoms is less than U for separated atoms, okay? And these energy differences here between, you know, bonded and separated, this is a rather large delta U compared to any of the U's we've been talking about before, contributions from kinetic, vibrational, you know, that sort of thing. This is really a big difference. Um, so the delta U's involved in bonding are much larger. than vibrational, rotational, translational, kinetic energy, and are also much larger than um, delta U's for breaking up or forming intermolecular forces. A hydrogen bond, for example, is about one-tenth 
of the um, has about one tenth the bond energy of an actual OH bond, for example. Okay, so um, I continued with this crazy talk that I gave to these uh, non-science folks um, to talk about, you know, to sort of put it down very basically what I just said, which is that U, for example, for H2 is smaller than U for two H's. And you could see you have the energy difference here. Um, well, actually, I guess this represents, you know, this, this arrow represents the delta U for going from 2H to H2 delta U is negative. And that's because a delta U is a final minus the initial. If you're forming a bond, the final is lower in energy than the initial. The difference is going to be negative. Um, UF minus UI is negative because UF is less than UI. And for oxygen, you'd have a very similar situation, except that the molecules, are, the atoms are larger. And so you'd have a larger difference in delta U. So O2 bonds are stronger than H2. So you have a larger delta U here. All right, and delta U for, um, so, so U of O2 will be less than U of two O's. The two O goes to O2 reaction as a negative delta U. U final is less than U initial. So what if I stack up the atoms? Let's say I stack up two O's and four H's, and I have a certain internal energy here. Here's the U scale. This is my internal energy for those six atoms. And then if I form two, hydro, hydro, two H2 molecules and one O2 molecule, you have this def difference in internal energy which wouldn't be the same as what it was for just forming one bond because here you're forming three different bonds, okay? So um, you get the idea that, um, you know, whether atoms are bonded or not really, um, that the internal energy depends on whether atoms are bonded or not, and that you have changes in internal energy as you go from atoms that are separated to bonded atoms et cetera, for more complicated reactions. So then I asked this question, which I just showed you the answer. What else can you do with hydrogen and oxygen atoms? And of course, what you could do is, is make water and you would make two water molecules from the four hydrogens and the two oxygens from above. And suppose I wanted to um, figure out, um, what the relative energies of all these things are, right? So I have two hydrogen, sorry, two O's and four H's. That's one way of having um, these pieces of matter. You could also have one O2 and two H2's, okay? Or you could have two H2O molecules. These are three different ways you can have these things, and this is how their energies stack up. All right. Um, so this is internal energy again on the axis here on the y axis. Um, and you could see here, show you the difference between the separated atoms and the H2 and O2 molecules. But water is actually lower in energy. So water is down here. And there's a bigger delta U between the separated atoms and for water. Then there's also a delta U between the H2 and O2 molecules and water. So, you know, how can you tell if I'm lying to you here? How can, you know, uh, how do I know that um, H2O molecules, two in particular, are lower in energy than two H2s and one O2. And the way I know that 
is because I've seen this reaction. I've seen a hydrogen balloon, okay, with oxygen and the air around it, and just a very tiniest of spark causes the hydrogen and oxygen to, relax, to react. You get a huge boom. You get lots of heat coming out. Okay. Um, and we happen to know from Gen Chem that delta H for this reaction is negative. It's highly exothermic. Well, delta U is very closely related to the delta H. And in PCHEM, we talk a lot about the relationship between delta U and delta H. But basically, the lion's share, the biggest contribution to delta H and delta U uh, for any chemical reaction is the bonds that are made and the bonds that are broken. Um, that's the most important thing. So, so the next question really is where did the energy go? Is it lost? And actually energy is never lost. Energy is conserved. Um, where the energy goes, according to the first law, the energy, the change in internal energy, which is responsible, uh, well, um, you know, the change in internal energy and going from reactants to products has to be the sum of the heat and the work contributions to it. So there are only two places the energy can go. It could go into heat and most of it does. Or it can end up with a work contribution, which is a little harder to access. But we're going to, I'm gonna to try to introduce you to that today. So because there's a great big boom, <laughs> when, when this reaction happens, it tells me that H2O, the two H2Os are much lower in energy on the U scale, that the, inter that the internal energy of, of the products is less than the internal energy of the reactants. So the U products minus U reactants, which is sort of like U final minus U initial is negative and that this is an exothermic reaction. And most of the energy, um, most of the delta U ends up as heat that is released into the surroundings. Okay, so lots of heat are released into the surroundings and work well. We don't really know about that yet, but we're gonna learn about it soon. Okay, so if you think we're ready to go and study reactions, we're really not, we're really not yet ready to jump into complicated chemical reactions. Okay, what we're gonna do is sort of study the first law a little bit. We're gonna look at the implications of the first law to simple systems first, okay? And we're gonna think about U and delta U. This is what we're gonna sort of have in mind. And we're gonna start with um, easier things than complicated chemical reactions. So, but the first thing I wanna tell you um, is that it's extremely difficult to actually know what the internal energy is for a complicated system. It's difficult to sort of count up all the contributions to the internal energy um, for most chemical systems. Okay, it's just too many contributing factors. Um, too many contributing factors. You can imagine that those intermolecular forces and those attractions are very hard to quantify. So it's just really a huge job. I would say it is a daunting task, very tough. So 
So um, we can do it for one simple system though. It's very boring, but I'm gonna tell it to you. Um, so the exception is the monatomic ideal gas. Okay, so what does a monatomic ideal gas have for energy? It has translational kinetic energy only, right? It has no rotations because it's just one single molecule. Well, it's many of these one single molecules. So it doesn't have an axis that makes you able to rotate to change the position of atoms. No rotations. There's no bond, so there's no vibrations. Um, there's no intermolecular forces. It really only has translational kinetic energy. So what is, so only translational kinetic energy. So what is the translational kinetic energy? Well, we know that the average kinetic energy for one mole is three halves RT, right? That's from the kinetic theory. Okay, so that's per mole. So we know that the molar internal energy is three halves RT. However, I left a space. And the reason I left a space is because as I've told you, this is what we call the thermal energy. This is the energy a molecule has or by virtue of the fact that the temperature is not zero, okay? But it turns out that atoms do have energy even when the temperature is zero. I call that the molar, um, molar internal energy at T equals zero, all right? So I really should add this in. And you know, this would be like nuclear energies, et cetera. The thing is, is that this is there for everything. And we're just gonna ignore it because chemists don't care. When we, when we calculate our changes in internal energy, we don't need to worry about that because everything's got, everything's got kind of the same thing. So we just take the molar internal energy to be three halves RT for a monatomic ideal gas. And we can easily figure out what that is, right? It's 1.5 times 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Temperature, let's take room temperature, 25 degrees C, which is 298K, room temperature. And that comes out to, once you convert it to kilojoules, um, 3.72 kilojoules per mole. Not a hell of a lot of energy. This is pretty small if you think about it. If you compare that to say the change in enthalpy for breaking an OH bond, you know, that's in the, I think around 300 something kilojoules per mole. So this is, a, we're talking about relatively very small energies here. All right. All right, we know, so we can figure out U from monatomic ideal gas, but this does not get us very far. Okay, and, um, and so I guess I would say the bad news is you really can't do this for any other relevant well, system, well, you could do it for a diatomic ideal gas, but that's not really gonna help us anymore. So that, that's kind of the bad news is that you can't count up the internal energy. Can't calculate U for anything else easily. But there is good news also. And that good news is that we don't need to. The first law does not talk about U. It talks about delta U, okay? So we don't need to calculate U. We need delta U. We need changes 
in internal energy. And the first law gives us kind of a rough recipe, right? Delta U is Q plus W, which if you put this in words, it, the way this is often stated is that the change in internal energy is the sum of the heat and work contributions, which does sound a little vague. And so I'll be spending a lot of time telling you how to calculate these different things. Um, but before I go into calculations, I wanna talk about uh, another sort of simple example. Not, not as simple as a monatomic ideal guess, but um, not as complicated as a complicated reaction either. So here's a simple example. And what I'm gonna talk about is if you take a beaker of water and you put it on a hot plate, so here's um, H2O, and I put it on a hot plate. And I heat it up. I got heating and stirring going on here. Here's my beaker. And here's my atmosphere. <laughs> Now, why am I writing all that down is because I want to tell you that we need to make a distinction between the system, which is the focus of our attention, and on the surroundings, which are the near neighbors of that focus that are affected by uh, whatever process is going on. So um, the system is simply our liquid water. Well, it's just water. It turns, it's still part of the system when it vaporizes. So it's our water. The surroundings is really like the whole the beaker, the hot plate, and the atmosphere. And I don't mean what's going on, you know, even across the city. I mean what's happening in this room right next to that, to that beaker of water. And the what I'm going to consider is boiling a sample of water. Okay, and how does water's internal energy change when this happens? Okay. All right, so what are the things that happens when you heat a sample of water? So you know you're, you're putting a lot of a lot of heat is going into this water from the hot plate, so the temperature is going to go up, and what that's going to lead to is much faster motion. A liquid molecules will be moving faster, even though we didn't do a kinetic theory of liquids. It is true that if you heat up a liquid, those molecules move faster as well. Translational rotational, vibrational energies all increase. Um, so this is a greater kinetic energy, all these different kinetic energy, well, vibrational is some potential energy as well. Also, intermolecular forces are, are affected. And in water, the main ones are hydrogen bonds again. So let me draw that similar picture to what I just drew. I think that's enough. And we have these hydrogen bonds here. Okay. And so when you heat up a sample of water, What happens is that the kinetic energy of the moving water molecules distorts or even breaks 
hydrogen bonds. So these hydrogen bonds are definitely affected. They're distorted or broken, okay? Um, and remember, you know, real bonds won't break. Those bonds are too strong, okay? You'd need hundreds of kilojoules per mole to break them. And we, you don't have that when you're heating a sample. Um, so what happens though is when, you're, when you break hydrogen bonds, that means that some liquid water molecules will vaporize. So it's like you're supplying them with the energy to sort of break away from each other and, um, and get into the gas phase. So this leads to some vaporization. So if you summarize so far, we have that the added heat, which is Q, okay, which we put into the beaker here, arrow going in represents the heat, okay, heating the system. It raises the temperature, okay, which increases kinetic energy, pulls apart some of the hydrogen bonds, and it leads to vaporization, which is another big thing that happens. Okay. All of these things mean an increase in internal energy. So U of the water increases. The final internal energy is greater than the initial, so that if we take U final minus U initial, it's delta U and it is positive. So if we put this, um, so so it means that H two O in the in the liquid has a greater internal energy than gaseous water. Okay. Um, well, I guess first I should say that you know just having the liquid water molecules moving faster means it has a greater internal energy, even if you didn't vaporize a single molecule. But the fact that the heat also contributes to vaporization tells you that the internal energy, oh, sorry, I have this all screwed up. This is, this is less than, that the internal energy of the liquid is lower than that of the gas. And that's because this is more stable. Why is the liquid more stable? Because of the hydrogen bonding, the intermolecular forces, the hydrogen bonds, stabilize water molecules. So attractions like, like hydrogen bonding, that's hard to read, attractions stabilize molecules in general and water in particular. And over here with the gas, we have few interactions, if any, So those are not stabilized by interactions, okay? All right, so that's great for that part, but there's actually something else, anything else that affects the internal energy. And this one is the hardest one to see and to realize is there. And there is a third thing, okay? Um, besides the temperature going up and leading to increased kinetic energy, besides the vaporization, there's also the fact that the system expands. Okay, so um, let's picture the atmosphere in this way. We do this a lot in PCAP. Here is a way of picturing the atmosphere above the sample of liquid and gaseous water. Here we have liquid and here we have gas above it. Okay, 
And so what I'd like you to do is picture the atmosphere as a piston, right? As you know, the top of this piston, this atmosphere is pushing down um, as a piston. Well, I guess this is the pit. But picture the atmosphere as pushing down like a piston, I guess, on the system. Okay? It pushes with the atmospheric pressure, P atmosphere. Um, what happens is the system, when it's being heated, we have two things that are going on here. So when the H2O is heated, you have a phase change from liquid to gas, right? You've got water, liquid goes to water, gas. This has a greater volume. The gas is a much greater volume than the liquid. So that's going to expand the system. Also, once you have molecules in the gas phase, heating um, gaseous water, water vapor, causes um, you know, that the temperature goes up. So it causes the volume to go up by Charles's law. So there were two reasons why you get expansion. So both of these cause the system to expand. And as the system expands, it pushes against the atmosphere. So the system, the, the system has to push against the atmosphere. And guess what? That is work. It's as if it's pushing that piston up when it expands. It's gonna push the piston up. Um, this is work. The system has to do some work. All right. And the energy to do that work has to come from somewhere. It has to be included in the accounting. Okay, so the energy to do that work has to come from somewhere. It has to be included. And the accounting is really what the first law does, right? The first law says delta U is Q plus W. So we have to add not just the heat that went into the system here, but the fact that the system is doing some work and that requires energy. So look at this, you know, here's a picture of our system, just a box representing the system. And we're letting a lot, a lot, a lot of heat is going into the system. There's a big arrow here representing the amount of heat that's going into this system. And then I'm gonna draw a little teeny arrow representing the work that the system does. Because I said, this is a very small effect actually, though it has to be included, okay? So Q is a large positive number, okay? And this serves to increase the internal energy. And it contributes to making delta U positive, right? But then we have a very small negative contribution. So in the future, you'll see when, when something increases the system's internal energy, the arrow is going into the system because the arrow really met, represents energy. When the system does little work, it requires energy. So it's going to expend that energy, right? 
So the small negative work serves to decrease you. So it contributes to making delta u negative. Well, the large term wins, okay? Overall, delta u is quite positive for this process. So the absolute value of q is greater than the absolute value of w, so q wins. Delta u is positive, okay? But it's the sum of those contributions, and you do have to include the work in there. And the miracle about this, or the sort of uh, the beauty of thermo, is you don't really need to know much of anything about what those molecules are doing, as long as you measure that heat that goes in and and you know figure out that work of expansion. You you figured out what the delta U is. So I guess I would say one of the beauty of it is you can figure all this out. without knowing much about what the individual molecules are doing. And that's why we say that thermodynamics is a study of energy and energy flow in macroscopic systems that you don't really need to know anything about the microscopic you know, properties of molecules although it certainly helps to explain things. Okay, so before I get to calculating what Q and W are, I'd like to talk about the signs of Q and W. The signs are very important and different fields of, of science have different conventions for these signs. So, and in PCAM we care very deeply about these signs. And what we do in PCHEM is we always think about the heat and work from the point of view of the system. What does that mean? So we, we asked the question, does the work increase or decrease the internal energy of the system? If the work increases the internal energy, we say it's positive. If it decreases the internal energy, we say it's negative. That's what I mean by looking at this from the point of view of the system. So we, we ask, does the work increase or decrease the system's internal energy. If W increases U, the work is positive. If W serves to decrease U, the work is negative, which sort of tells you that delta U equals Q plus W is really a very rough recipe because you have to figure out if the work is negative or the work is positive. For Q, it's pretty easy, right? Because you need to know the sign of Q as well. I guess I would say heat is easy. If it flows into the system, it's positive. If it flows out of the system, It's negative. And you know, we've used these terms in Gen Chem. We call it endothermic when it flows in and exothermic if it heat flows out. Okay, so now let's think about how to calculate um, Q and W. But first, I'd like to attack the work. First, W. How to calculate it. And really in this part of the course, the only kind of work that we, that we think about is expansion work. 
We will talk about other kinds of work later. So just expansion work for now and for quite a long time in this course. Okay, so what is work equal from physics? If I ask this, somebody's going to tell me it's force times distance. And that is true, but it's only true if the force does not vary over that distance. If force varies with distance, then we can't compute it that way. So this is only true if the force does not depend, which is true in a lot of cases, but is not true in all cases. If it does depend on distance, if the force does depend on the distance, then we need to use differentials. We say that dW, which is the infinitesimal amount of work done, would be equal to the force, could be a function of x times dx. So it tells you if force depends on x, you're gonna to have to do it this way. Um, you know, This is the force that's exerted at, this, at the particular distance x, you know, multiplied by the small distance right around that x. Okay, um, so these are infinitesimal distances and this is the force at a particular distance. All right, well, okay, in this class, the, we're talking about expansion work, the force, well, we really talk about pressure and pressure is force per unit area. So that means that the force we're talking about is pressure multiplied by area. So let me draw a, a, a system again. Um, so let's say here's my gas in here. And you know, I have this piston thing representing the atmosphere. And let's suppose it moves a small amount. So this would be my dx. And this is the area here of this. Okay, that's the area. So F, all right, so F dx is P A dx, okay? Um, but what is A dx? So here's my A, the area here, and here's my dx. Well, A dx is this volume in here. So this volume is A times dx. It's the area of the cylinder multiplied by the, the height, dx. So that tells me, um, let's see, so P A dx. Oh, so this is dV, the change in volume. So P dV is our sort of our starting place for what the work is. So dW is f dot dx, which is P dV. So, so we have this formula for calculating expansion work. But now I have to ask a question. First of all, what pressure are we talking about here? I think I've, I've said this, but we're gonna be very clear on this. Okay, so the gas has a pressure, right? The gas has a pressure. P gas, which I would just call P. This is the pressure inside 
of this, this thing I've drawn. Um, but then we have the atmosphere. We would call, could call it P atmosphere, or we could call it commonly P external. And um, it's really the pressure outside, right? So we've got the atmospheric pressure pushing down, you've got the gas pressure pushing up. Um, and so DW is P external. Yeah, what, so the, the, the pressure that's used here is the pressure that the gas is pushing against, right? So the pressure used here is the opposing pressure. The pressure the gas pushes against, which is, you know, the external pressure. So DW is P external DV. But we have to ask ourselves another question. And that is, does this definition of the work, the infinitesimal amount of work done, give the correct sign? OK. So when the system expands, it does work. It, it, it requires energy to do that work. So the work has got to be negative, you know? So let me write that down. So when the system expands, it does work. So from the point of view of the system, the work has to be negative because it takes energy to do that work. Okay. So let's take a look at this work, uh, this deep, if you, if we want to know what is the sign of the work. So we want to integrate this equation. We have DW is P external DV. If we integrate this, the integral of these little contributions to the work is the work. This P external is really P atmosphere and it's constant, right? It's a barometric pressure and you could take it out of the integral and then you just have the integral of DV between the two volume limits. So this would be P atmosphere you know, the integral of dV is V evaluated between the two limits. It's just V2 minus V1. So work is given by this. If it's an expansion, that means that V2 is greater than V1. So this would be positive. And of course the pressure is positive. So this predicts a positive value for the work. But we know that the system is doing that work. This is incorrect. It's incorrect because we know the work has to be negative. Because the system is doing it, the system has to supply the energy for it. So we need to change. our definition of expansion work. Just a little, just so we get the right sign. So the way we define it, we say DW is minus P external times DV. Get that minus sign in there. You need this for the sign to be correct. So DW, is minus P external dV here. The external pressure is constant. You can take it out of the integral.
So now with an expansion, V2 is greater than V1, so this is positive, but this, this P external is positive, but you bring a negative sign. So the work is negative. And for a compression, work is minus P external, it's the same thing, it'll end up being V2 minus V1, except V2 is less than V1. So this will be negative and this will be negative. And so the whole thing will be positive. So the work, when you, if you're compressing the system, leads to a negative work. So that would help, sorry, compressing to a positive work, which contributes to increasing the internal energy. Expanding, W is negative, this contributes to decreasing the internal energy of the system. Okay. All right.